I am uh, Rabbi Adam Shalom. I work as the rabbi of Kol Hadash Humanistic Congregation in North Suburban Chicago. And um, I also serve as the Dean for North America of the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism, which is the leadership training and educational arm of our movement. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be able to do this kind of adult learning experience, uh, which we've done as webinars and online classes and other kinds of programming over the course of the last few months. And we look forward to doing more in the future. Um, and I'll turn it over to Rabbi Sivan Moss to introduce herself and to take us into the story of Ruth. Shalom, Chag Sameach from Jerusalem. Hi, uh, Shalom, and uh, happy holidays from uh, Jerusalem. My name is Rabbi Sivan Mas, and I'm the Dean of the International Institute for Secular Humanistic uh, Judaism in Israel, called Tmura Israeli Judaism. So hi, everyone. I'm very excited uh, to be here. Um, and I think we shall just dive in to uh, the actual story uh, so that we can have time to talk about um, um, wh what it actually uh, means. Um, so as stories begin, um, once upon a time, there was a family that lived in the house of bread, Beit Lechem, that is the name the house of bread, which is really Bethlehem, the city that you've all heard about and uh, some of you I know already visited. Anyway, the name probably was there because this was a place where there was bread. But our story begins in famine. Our story begins in great hunger. And um, a man, his wife and his two sons, leave Bethlehem and go to a country, uh, not too far, but an enemy country, and uh, which is called Moab. And they go to Moab and, you know, sometimes there are these bad people who you think that they're really bad and you really call them your enemies, but they may not think that because after all, they come to Moab and they live in Moab and the two sons get married with two women and they mm -hmm. probably have a good life, except for the fact that they all die. In other words, all the men die. Elimelech, who is the father, dies. And then uh, Machlon and Kilion, who are the sons, and Adam will probably talk about their names later, um, uh, they die as well. And we are now beginning a story of heroines. There is this, uh, the mother, who her name is Naomi, and the two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Opa, not Oprah, Opa. Almost same letters, different time, different person. Okay, so Ruth and Opa, the two daughters-in-law, um, have some sort of a strong connection to Nomi. I want to try and figure out what this connection really is. Anyway, Nomi says to them that she heard that the hunger stopped in Israel and that uh, she wants to go back home because what does she have to do here in Moab? And the daughters-in-law say, fine, we'll come with you. And it seems that they start walking towards Israel and she says to them, go back, go back to your mother's home. Why are you coming with me? And they try to stay with her, but then Opa sort of gives up and says, okay, fine, I'm, I'm going to go home. But you have to understand that this is, they cry, they're really sad, they're really connected to her. But Ruth says, no. Ruth says, I'm going to go with you. Wherever you go, I will go. Your God is my God. You know these famous, these famous lines, so I won't repeat them. But basically she says to her, I am going to be with you until death will part us. Basically, we find that later, I guess, in the Catholic uh, wedding vows. But this is where it begins, this kind of notion of a woman saying, I'm going to be with you. Is this really a love story? Is it in a platonic love story? Is it a lesbian love story? Is it a love story? 
Now listen to what actually happens to this woman, to these women. After this great rhetoric, this exceptional speech, well known until today by Ruth, what does Nomi reply to her? Nothing. She absolutely says nothing. And they continue to go back home, back to this house of bread, back to Bethlehem. And when she meets people in the entrance to Bethlehem and they say to her, hi, Nomi. And she tells them how bad her situation is. Her name is not Nomi anymore. It's a different name. She doesn't even introduces Ruth. Ruth is transparent. She's not there. The story then continues, and eventually we hear that she talks to Ruth, and she says to her, listen, we're hungry. Go out to the field and, and get some food for us. We're poor, and the rich people have this Jewish ritual in which they leave um, some uh, uh, wheat uh, for us, and it's harvest time, so go. So she goes, and she says, and she goes to the field, and there's a story about her being in the field. We don't have time to go into it. It's really a short story. I think you should read it. It's something like four chapters, worthwhile reading. Anyway, she goes to the field and she starts, um, um, and, and she gets whatever she needs. She gets food, she goes back home or back to wherever Nomi is. And uh, she says to Nomi, you know, you know who this who is the owner of this field? And Nomi says, no. And she says the name, she's, oh, you know, he's, he's family. He's part of our family. And then she contrives this scheme. And the scheme is, this is Nomi, okay? Ruth, we don't know of this kind of initiative at all from her. That's why I'm asking, is there a love story here? I'm not sure. And she says, she says to Ruth, you know what, Ruth? At night, you should go to Boaz. This is their uh, family um, connection. You should go to Boaz. And in, in her mind, she already thinks if she will be able to get married to Boaz, then they'll be safe and they'll have this rich family, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, she says to her, she doesn't say all of this to her. She says to her, go to Boaz at night. Get dressed in your finest clothes. Put perfume on. I don't know where they got the perfume. They're really poor, etc. It doesn't matter. Get the perfume. Get dressed really, really fine. And at night, crawl into the place where he's sleeping. And he will tell you what to do. You know, men know what to do. They'll tell you what to do. And Ruth says, fine. She obeys. And she goes there at night. And here comes this interpretation. You can read those uh, uh, few lines in various ways. One of the ways that uh, you could read those lines is that um, um, she, goes, um, she, she, goes, she goes at night and she says to her, um, pick up his blanket. Now, until where should you pick up his blanket? Only to see his pinky toe? Or maybe to see all of his legs? We don't know. Because in Hebrew it says, margelotav. In other words, basically, the lower part of his body. And it says in the Bible, that she lay on him. It also says in the Bible, vailafet. In other words, it could be translated that he was caught. He could also be startled, but he could also be caught. In other words, they could have had intercourse. Would you call it rape? Maybe. Will you call it intercourse? Some interpreters will, some won't. But think about the relationship between these two women. What did actually Naomi tell her to do? 
In one inter interpretation, she told him to rape Boaz. Why? Because he will then have to marry her. Well, I don't know if he will have to. He chooses to. And in the end, he chooses to marry her. He marries her. And she becomes the great, great grandmother of King David. Now, you could probably make up a much better story <laughs> to tell about the next great king of Israel, the most important, one of the most important kings of Israel, who is not Jewish. His great, great, great grandmother is Moabite, one of those nations that you should never marry according to the law. But what troubles me is this story of heroines who have to take destiny into their own hands by the only means that they have probably at that time. Poor, lonely widows. One is Jewish, the other one is not. Presumably, she cannot get married when she comes to Israel. And she is told by her mother-in-law to sleep with Boaz, to rape Boaz. Doesn't sound good, any of that. But the outcome is pretty good. We end up having a king. Some of us will think he is a good king. What is really interesting in the end of the story is that once Ruth gives birth, the child is almost not hers anymore. It is Naomi that holds him and breastfeeds him. It is the neighbors, the women neighbors, who give him a name. He becomes transparent again. We hardly know of her anything, but we have a king. What is the relevance of this story to our age? We'll talk about later. I will giving the screen back to you, <laughs> Adam. Thank you, Sivan. Wonderful. Um, as Paul said at the beginning of the session, uh, we're celebrating Shavuot tonight and tomorrow. Um, and he mentioned it's not one of the big three holidays that most diaspora Jews celebrate today, which would be Hanukkah, Pesach, and the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Uh, the irony is that there used to be three big holidays, but only one of them is the same as the three we have today. And that was Pesach, the spring harvest holiday. Shavuot was the summer harvest holiday, and the fall harvest holiday was Sukkot. And those were the three Chagim, the three formal festivals that were agricultural long before there was even a Torah, let alone there were rabbis saying what the Torah meant and connecting this holiday with the supposed giving of that Torah. Uh, and the connection of Ruth with the holiday is very obvious when you read the story, because they are harvesting wheat. And part of her job, opportunity, charity, is to be able to glean the field. What does it mean to glean? Well, when you go through and harvest wheat, you chop down the wheat, but some of the grains of wheat fall to the ground. Now, the landowner could go back through and have servants go by and pick up every last grain. But what happens instead, according to biblical legislation, is that you leave what has fallen behind for the widow and the orphan. The same is true for the corner of the field. When you turn your, um, your oxen that are harvesting, there'll be a corner of the field left. That's for the widow and the orphans too. One of the interesting aspects of the story of Ruth, one of the different lenses we can use to look at it, is how it's a different way to talk about the law. Instead of simply listing the law, now it's a story dramatizing the law and why the law is important. And the other thing I love about gleaning as a metaphor for reading the Bible is that you have the harvest and then you can go over the field again and get something else out. And then you can go over the field again and get something else out. And that's what we do with these stories. We can read them again and again in different ways with different lenses and glean different things from that story. In fact, there's a session later tonight with another humanistic rabbi offering another take on the book of Ruth. And so you'll have more, more opportunities to explore that. 
one of the questions that secular and humanistic Jews ask of Bible stories is, where did it come from? Who wrote it? And why? And when? What was their agenda? So in answering that for the Book of Ruth, most likely the Book of Ruth, Ruth was written after the Babylonian exile. So this is maybe around the year 500 BCE. And it may well be a rebuttal to another Jewish voice that also makes it into the Tanakh, into the Hebrew Bible. And that is the ethnic exclusiveness of Ezra the priest. In Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8, you can read Ezra the priest telling all the Israelites, send away your foreign wives. You've polluted the gene pool and you need to send them away. Um, and they do, the ones who stay as part of the Israelite community. The others are called the Samaritans who become a conflicting group with the Hebrews uh, in later centuries. And there's a particular choice in this story of the Moabites. Why the Moabites? Well, the Moabites first appear in Genesis chapter 19, where Lot, Abraham's nephew, uh, has bastard children with his own daughters. They get him drunk, they sleep with him, and then uh, it produces uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites. My guess is the Moabites and Ammonites themselves told a different story about where they came from, but this is the Israelite story of where the Moabites came from. They're literally bastards from the beginning. Um, the Moabites are also blamed as being tempting women when Jews are mixing with the surrounding peoples in uh, the book of Numbers chapter 25. And they're explicitly listed in Deuteronomy chapter 23, as Sivan mentioned, no Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of Yahweh, not even the 10th generation. Now, one of the ways the rabbis work around this problem with the book of Ruth is they say, well, it says Moabites, uh, Moavim, the male Moabites. But if you know anything about Hebrew, when you have a mixed gender group, it, it at least historically took the male plural. So there are plenty of other times where it's the male plural and they say it applies to everybody. But in this case, they try to find a way to harmonize the discontinuity between one generation's ethnic exclusivity, a la Deuteronomy, a la Ezra, and another generation's inclusivity, a la the Book of Ruth. In fact, names are very important to this story, not just the title of a tribe, but the title of the people themselves. Sivan already mentioned the irony of having a famine in Beit Lechem, in the house of bread. Naomi's two sons are named Machlon and Chilion, and uh, in a commentary on this in the Babylonian Talmud some centuries later, this happens to be in Bava Batra 91b, for anyone who wants to look it up, um, it says, one was called Machlon because he profaned the bodies, Chulin. So he is profanation or, you know, being profane. And the other is called Chilion because he was liable to receive a punishment of destruction, Kiliah, for his sinning against God, whether it's the sin of going to Moab or the sin of leaving Israel or the sin of intermarrying or some other undetermined sin. Uh, these people are named for their sin. I mean, my guess is that Naomi and Elimelech didn't name them, you know, uh, profanation and destruction at the beginning. These are very convenient names for the story. Naomi herself is an interesting name. She's, Naomi means pleasant. When you meet someone in Hebrew, you say Naim Ma'od, nice to meet you. But she asks people to call her Mara, which means bitter. But the irony is nobody listens. The whole rest of the story, she's Naomi, Naomi, Naomi. No one calls her Mara. Ruth supposedly converts in this episode at the beginning. She says, your people are my people. But the whole rest of the story, she's Ruth HaMoavia, Ruth the Moabite. And you're not supposed to remind converts where they come from. And yet she gets reminded over and over again, Moabite, Moabite, Moabite. Even Boaz, the man she becomes attached to, his uh, name means in him is strength. So that also has the idea of a heroic role. Um, in the end, Ruth is claimed by another kinsman in the family, part of a ritual called yibum or leveret marriage, where if two brothers are living together and one of them dies without an heir, the other brother can marry the widow and produce an heir for the deceased brother. There's an idea of keeping the name of the deceased going and keeping the land and the family. The irony in this story is the kinsman who's closer than Boaz to marry Ruth is called Plony, which means anonymous, miscellaneous. No, he, he gets no name. So he's supposed to bring up the name and he himself has no name. Um, and then even the naming process at the end is connected with the story of Judah and Tamar, which appears in Genesis, another example of leveret marriage and giving wives to brothers after someone has died. But as Sivan pointed out, the child isn't even named by either parent. The other interesting layer to Ruth that I wanted to mention is the layer of language. 
when I took an introductory biblical Hebrew class at the Hebrew University 20 years ago, um, they assigned the book of Ruth as one of the books to study because there's a particular grammatical form in Hebrew that almost never appears except for in the book of Ruth. It's a feminine plural form that ends ena. So I'll give you an example of this. This is in, Gen uh, sorry, in Ruth chapter one, verse nine, where Naomi says, Yiten yave lachem, may God deal well with you, umatsena, and may y'all female find, instead of matsu, which would be the conventional form today, menucha, isha, beit isha, woman for, uh, in each of her house, batishak lachem, and she kissed them, vatesena, and they lifted up, but again, that ena ending is that odd feminine form. They lift up their voice, va and they cried. Again, that ena ending is that feminine plural form. Uh, some of you may be familiar with an old Israeli Zionist song, tsena tsena, tsena 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 It's the same idea, go out and look, but it's go out and look for women. Or in Yiddish literature, the tsena urena was go out and see, but addressed to women to go out and see. And this is emblematic of the dilemma of women characters in the Hebrew Bible. There's so rarely a group of women that are being addressed as women without a mixed group that then takes the male plural. It's a sort of biblical version of what's called the Bechdel test, where the um, writer Alison Bechdel said, can you find a movie where two women are talking to each other, not about a man? And it's, there, it's amazing how many movies fail to pass what would sound to be that simple test. Or go back and forth at your dinner table and see how many women who actually have names in the Bible you can recall, not wife of Noah, but or wife of Job, but actual named characters. Sometimes the rabbinic midrash corrects it and adds some names, but often they're just the wife of so-and-so and they don't get their own name. Even today in Israel, um, there's a debate over how to handle these plurals. Because uh, if, it's a, if it's a group of 88 women and one man, it takes the male plural. Does that make sense? Or maybe you say it twice. You say it once with the feminine, once with the masculine, or now some people even put them all together. So you'd say, Baruchimot ha baimot. And it sounds odd to we who grew up with a different model, but perhaps it's more inclusive. And that's part of the turning back to the same story. Now that even the grammar has a lesson to teach us about gender, identity, groups, and individuality. So I'll turn it back over to Sivan for some more thoughts. Um, so my, my thoughts are really, how does this connect to this concept of tikkun that Paul was talking about uh, in the beginning and which is sort of the headline for what we're doing today? So as, as we has been mentioned, tikkun is about repairing. It's about getting ready for something. And I wanted to to um, tell you about how I see the story of Ruth and reading the story of Ruth and reinterpreting it is something which is very relevant to us. First of all, I think it's important that this treasure, which uh, this Jewish treasure box that we have, that the Bible is certainly part of it, within it there are wonderful works of art, and some of them are not so great. I think the story of, of Ruth, that's my personal view, is a good story. It really is. It's written well. Adam was telling us about the wonderful language in it. Uh, there's so many layers in it. So it's relevant to us as any good literature would be relevant uh, to us. But I think it's also relevant to us because it raises questions valuable questions about our value system, how we treat others. And um, the story of the tikkun, I believe, should be about that. It has been about that for at least a decade or two in Israel, and I have learned that it is the same in other places uh, in the world. In other words, not only reading these stories, but asking, okay, so what do we do to repair the world? Um, something similar to that happened in Israel in the early 20s when they asked the same thing about the Shabbat. Bialik in 1926 starts in Tel Aviv something which he calls the pleasure of Shabbat, Oneg Shabbat. And the idea was 
to create this bridge of the new secular city to a wonderful spiritual uh, opportunity, which is called Shabbat, but in a different way. And the same thing happened to the holiday of Shavuot. One of the first things that happened to the holiday of Shavuot was coming back to Israel for the Israelites, coming back to Israel and going out to the fields and harvesting and having a wonderful Shavuot celebrations with songs and dance and etc. Cetera, etc., cetera, which may be similar to what happened years and years ago during biblical times. But that's not all that happened in Israel. About 20 years ago, a little less, in one of the kibbutzim, they started this tikkun in, in the kibbutz Beit Shita, they started this tikkun, which was a study again. And a few years later, Alma in Tel Aviv started a urban tikkun. And just like in 1926, when Bialik started it in a apartment, and then it moved to a, 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 a hall, and then it moved to a bigger hall, and eventually they built a whole hall for it called the, the tent of, of the name, or Ohel Shem. Um, uh, the same thing happened to Tikkun. It grew and grew and grew, and if you saw the link that Adam shared with you today from Haaretz, you can see that there's so many tikkunim going on in Israel, same like they're going on, uh, are going on in America. So one of the things that I wanted to share with you is what we did in our tikkun this year. Basically divided it into two kinds. One, very much, very similar to what we're doing today and what you will continue to do tonight. The other one, we said, wait a minute, let's look beyond what we call the, uh, Ren the Jewish Renaissance liberal world and see what goes on in Israel. Who are those uh, initiators that are trying to change our society for the better? So for the last week, every night, we met with a different um, enterprise in Israel. We met with, a, uh, with a, a, an association that helps uh, people who have been living in the ultra-Orthodox world to come out to the uh, secular world and uh, take part as people who are do, uh, creating a new life for themselves. We met with two organizations that help uh, people, women um, uh, aspire to become uh, um, uh, politicians um, in uh, the Israeli uh, parliament and, in, uh, uh, and younger politicians starting to become active in politics to fight for equality uh, in Israel. And last night we met with an organization that um, combats um, a sexual assault for, uh, for, uh, against, uh, against anyone and tries to change the laws in Israel. In other words, what we can do when we talk about tikkun is on the one hand study where the tikkun came from, what is the cultural roots, where do we as secular rabbis or secular communities um, uh, can take part in this, but also step out of this uh, uh, liberal Jewish world um, that we do, uh, that we have uh, in Israel and say, okay, let's support all these other uh, um, um, initiatives that we believe in by giving them a place, by giving us an opportunity to learn about them. I believe that is a real tikkun, is to figure out how we can repair ourselves, how can we letaken ourselves to have a better world, to live in a better society. It, yes, it is up to us. Back to you, Adam. Thank you, Sivan. Um, I wanted to mention to people as well that when it comes to the Book of Ruth and finding relevance to it today, you have to start by finding it. 
And it depends on which Bible you're looking in, in terms of where you might find it. Um, in a Hebrew Bible or a Tanakh, it's found near the end. There's a collection of five holiday festival scrolls or Megillot that are put together. So when someone says the whole Megillah, you have to ask them, ask them which Megillah. It doesn't automatically mean the Megillah of Esther. Uh, the Book of Lamentations, Ecclesiastes is there. Actually, some of the most interesting books of the Bible are in the Megillot. Um, that's one of the reasons why I agree with Paul that uh, too much focus on Torah is too bad because you miss out on all the other good stuff to be found certainly post-Bible, but even within the Hebrew Bible, but beyond the first five books of the Torah. Um, so in a Christian Bible, you'll find the book of Ruth right after the book of Judges, which makes sense since the first line of the book of Ruth is in the days when the judge is judged. So they put it there. But when the rabbis were assembling the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, and remember, they didn't write it, but they chose what books would be in it and what order they would show up, they put the book of Ruth with these festival scrolls and the calendar that they we're leading. So you have to find it in the right place. And then to think about what it means, you can read the story and start thinking about it for yourself. I mean, one question we didn't even ask, and we may not have time to ask, is where is God in this story? I mean, he's in a couple of names. Elimelech, the husband who dies of Naomi, is God is my king, but doesn't seem to be helping particularly much until the very long roundabout end of the story. It's a very long way to go, and couldn't there be a more efficient route to helping out? Um, again, interesting that Esther and Ecclesiastes, also in the Megillot, raise these kind of questions and raise the question of how did these even make it in to the Hebrew Bible? I think one of the ways that this book does find a comfortable place and also relates to Sivan's concept of tikkun, improving society and the world, is that it's demonstrating this question of ethics and laws. You know, you get caught up on the legalism sometimes and that can obscure the humanity behind it the legalism of the Moabite exclusion versus the kindness that Ruth is showing to her mother-in-law, but also the legalities of who is and who is not Jewish and who's a full person and who's a partial person. You know, the whole idea of leveret marriage is maintaining the male line in the family. It doesn't say anything about what the woman thinks about being married off to her brother-in-law. Um, at one point, Naomi tells Ruth to go out in the fields, but she says, go with the women, don't go around in the field with the men, which relates back to another passage in Torah law that says if a woman is in a field and is raped, then you give her the benefit of the doubt in that case because she could have called out for help and no one came. But if she's raped in the city or simply found having sex in the city, you assume it's her fault. And she was complicit in this because she could have cried out for help and people would have heard her. Again, our values in dealing with these questions of rape and women's autonomy are going to be very different. Or even counting whose child she is. A child is born to Naomi, say the women of the town, who then give the name to her. It's almost like the handmaids, Bilha and Zilpa. You know, when we count the matriarchs of Judaism, we often skip them, even though they are the mothers of tribes, according to the Torah's genealogy. But they aren't full people because they're servants, and they're just the handmaids. In fact, I pointed out to someone the parallel between Genesis and the modern show and the Margaret Atwood novel, The Handmaid's Tale, and they said, wow, what a coincidence. And I said, no, <laughs> Margaret Atwood read the Bible and used that as the model. And they quote the text as part of the novel. Uh, but it has real, again, resonance today with the role of women in society, their autonomy, and even their bodily autonomy for claiming their own children. Um, and there's even a very subtle line. And this is, again, what I love about being able to read the Hebrew language and explore it through that lens. When Ruth goes to visit Boaz, he gives her some wheat, some something of value, and sends her home. And then when she sees Naomi, she has to explain away why she's coming home with something of value, because uh, she doesn't want Naomi to get the wrong idea either. Um, so that's why the Bible text is often very limited in terms of emotion, description, the kind of things you'd expect in a novel. That's the reason why it can fit in a smaller space than uh, a full written English Tanakh. Uh, but it also leaves openings for these kinds of questions of how far did the blanket go up, who jumped on whom, uh, and what was the end result, and what will people think if they see uh, Ruth leaving Boaz in the morning with an armful of something of value? Well, she has to find an explanation that will at least pass muster with her mother-in-law, if not with anybody else. So um, I wanted to stop with the formal presentation, uh, the frontal presentation here, and we'll take a look at some of the questions that people have asked in the chat or in the Q&A.
So I'll let Sivan uh, talk first and while I take a look at what's been written. Um, so um, I'll refer to one question there and there's another one. So you could refer to the other one, but um, uh, Naomi's uh, um, sons, we don't know that they were uh, killed. We know that they died. Um, maybe they were sick and they died as their names seem to, uh, um, seem to mention. Um, I think that, uh, so, so please uh, do, if you have uh, more questions, please write them uh, in the chat. And I just wanted to, um, to relate to another thing um, in the story. Um, the story is really about people. I think that's what makes the story good. It's about people. It's about a certain time of year. And if you read it, and you read it more than once, you actually start feeling this, you know, beginning of summer in Israel, the time where, uh, you know, the wheat starts to grow, you actually get the atmosphere. And maybe that's why it influenced art so much. So many artists, so many paintings, and the, since photography is here, so many photographs and songs and and other stories have been written as uh, were influenced and inspired by the story as we were doing this tikkun it was interesting one of our fellows mentioned that in israel even though there are many many songs not poems many many songs that were written inspired by the bible there are hardly any about the book of ruth so I'm waiting for your questions, but I'm going to leave you with this question. Um, yes, Adam. Great. So another question from uh, Peter asking, do the more religious see the Ruth story as affirming of others adopting Judaism and the Jewish family and see this Megillah as a positive or inspiring story? Um, the answer is yes. Um, and remember, religious in Jewish life is a very wide spectrum. And so some so self-labeled religious Jews are very welcoming of people joining the Jewish family and are open to that. And others are more exclusivist uh, in their orientation. Um, I mean, there's a traditional concept that if someone comes to you to convert, you're supposed to tell them to go away three times before you let them in. Now, in the Middle Ages, when it could be dangerous to both the convert and the Jewish community to do that conversion, there's a pragmatic side to that reality. Where we live today, in most cases, it's uh, an elective choice, you know, to become Jewish in the diaspora is a, a lifestyle change. It's a, a, a personal identification, which is why we're much more open to a Ruth style conversion. But I think throughout Jewish history, you have these two trends, the Ezra trend of exclusion and pushing away and the Ruth trend of inclusion and welcoming. Um, you even get a little bit of both within the book of Ruth because she's still called a Moabite the whole time. Even though she said, your people are my people, she should say, who are you talking about? No Moabites here. <laughs> um, I'm now an Israelite, but it's, it's still a part of remembering who she is. And one of the things I love about our movement's approach to this is you can be more than one thing at a time. Um, I'll be speaking at another learning session with Limud Oz in Australia in a couple of weeks. And the topic there I'll be talking about is being Jewish and not just Jewish or something else, but the fact that we can have multiple identities and think about ourselves as Jewish and men or women or other alternatives and Jewish and American, Jewish and Israeli as different categories of thought, uh, Jewish and straight, Jewish and gay, Jewish and Italian, if that's your heritage, Jewish and Moabite, if that's your heritage. You know, I wonder if King David might say, hmm, I'm curious, I did an Ancestry.com test and it shows I have a certain percentage of Moabite DNA and maybe I should investigate that part of my heritage. From our perspective, you can do that because you can be Jewish and something else in all of your complexity. Um, and that's why I think the model of a family is the best one. It's not a total conversion where you leave behind your past. It's joining a family where your family tree is still there and you can still find those roots. So I love that Ruth is still called the Moabite. If she would be comfortable with that, and uh, maybe then that would have a long-term impact in terms of our sense of diversity. I mean, the last thing I wanna mention to draw back to what Paul started with, we think of the Bible as the book because with the technology, we can fit it all into one volume. Um, but reality, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh is the books, not just the Torah as the books, but 
and the stories within the books, but the Hebrew Bible itself is the books. And the fact that there's disagreement between Ezra and Ruth means that we've always disagreed as a Jewish people and never had one perspective that was uh, always and uh, universally accepted. Um, so if we tend to the Ruth side and others tend to the Ezra, we're still both authentic and Jewish. I just wanted to um, take this opportunity. I know that we have to um, finish and uh, excited to hear uh, the next lessons uh, in the Tikkun. I just wanted to take the opportunity um, to say thank you that uh, what we're doing now, you couldn't do in biblical times. <laughs> there was no way that we could talk across the Atlantic and uh, share our views and talk amongst ourselves as Jews uh, from all over the world, people who um, say what they believe and do as they say, uh, which is what Ruth is trying to do. She's saying, okay, this is what I'm going to believe. And now look at me, this is what I'm going to do. And you watch her and she does uh, go about life with full integrity. And I guess uh, that's a, another good lesson to say, wow, maybe she was one of the first humanist Jews and uh, she couldn't be with us today on Zoom, but <laughs> we're certainly inspired by her. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul, Adam, for this uh, opportunity. And um, I guess good night from Israel, but it's not goodbye. And thank you, Sivan, as well, for staying up late where you are. Um, I love the idea that this is, I mean, maybe it's too Greek of a model, but it's like the Olympic torch relay <laughs> where we're handing off from one side to the other and uh, we'll pick it up and continue studying. And maybe if someone over there decides to get up early, they can pick it up in the morning uh, <laughs> and go on from there. Uh, but that's again, you know, the idea of study as a collective model. Um, we learn as you learn. I learn things about the Book of Ruth in preparing for this program and presenting it. Um, so I find that that model of learning is wonderful. You know, being a rabbi doesn't mean that you're like a priest with a different level of holiness and connection to the ultimate truths. You've learned more, you've studied, and so you can always learn more and study. Um, there's a line in the uh, Sayings of the Fathers, a collection of rabbinic wisdom, uh, who is wise, the person who learns from all people. Uh, and so we learn from all Jewish stories and heritage, we learn from all people, Thanks for the questions that were asked, and thank you to all of you participating who make this kind of program possible.